Hey y'all, my name is Miriam and it's time to paint. So let's get started. Today we're talking all about painting the eyes. Now eyes for me were one of the trickiest things to wrap my mind around. So today I wanna share with you some of my favorite tips and tricks and techniques for painting the eye, no matter how realistic or how stylized you may want that eye to be. We'll talk about common mistakes you often see while painting the eye, how to overcome those mistakes, and we'll also chat about painting the eye from reference versus imagination. Now there's no right way to paint an eye, but no matter how you do it, there's one thing that holds true. Eyes carry an insane amount of visual weight. Our brains are pre-programmed to recognize and seek out faces, and the main indicator for that is often the eyes. Our brains try and see faces in everything, even when they're not actually there. Now, simply put, eyes are like a beacon out at sea, directing and compelling the viewer's gaze. They're a central force in your portrait, and no matter what else you may have going on in your painting, you can bet your viewer's eyes are going to land here. Now, for artists, this is both good and bad. Good, because it gives you an indication about your viewer's behavior. Knowing that their eyes will usually travel first to the eyes in your portrait is valuable information, especially when it comes to building interesting compositions. The not so good part? It can be a lot of pressure knowing how important the eyes are and feeling the need to get them just right. I mentioned there's no right way to paint an eye, and that's true. Throughout history, the evolution of how we depict eyes has changed dramatically from highly stylized and symbolic to incredibly detailed and realistic and everything in between. The techniques and tips I'm gonna talk about today revolve around how I personally handle the eyes. This is in no way a comprehensive guide or me saying that this is the right way. It's just my own personal approach and experience. You'll find an approach that works best for you. Now, the things that I wanna talk about today are things that I do think are helpful no matter the approach. So let's get into it. To talk about the eye, we need to first talk about anatomy. Why learn anatomy when we could just look at the reference photo? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but let's go with my favorite. Because pictures lie, or at least they don't always tell the full truth. Take a look at this photo of my eye. I took it on my iPhone. It's how I take a lot of my reference photos. Can you see the bottom plane of my top lid? Can you tell where it ends and where my sclera begins? What about my left eye? Can you make out the top plane of my bottom lid? Maybe, but it's really hard. It's hard for me to decipher what's really going on in this picture, and it's easy to see how someone might oversimplify by skipping the planes of the lids altogether, combining areas, or by using a single line to represent multiple forms. Now, this isn't a bad thing when it's a stylistic choice, and there's many artists who do this very effectively. But if you're anything like me, the use of line and oversimplification wasn't necessarily a stylistic choice, but rather a lack of understanding of what I was really seeing. This is an old painting of mine. I'll bring it back up later, but I just wanted to show you guys that all of the things that we're talking about today when it comes to the eyes are all things that I personally struggled with. And I know a lot of other people do too. Now, I don't think my old paintings are bad, but my lack of understanding when it came to anatomy really restricted my creative freedom. I wasn't painting this way because it was my style. I was painting this way because I didn't really know what was going on. Okay, back to anatomy. Learning this stuff will help you so that you're not bound to your reference photo and will give you more freedom when you decide you want to go off script or when working from imagination. First, let's talk about the actual eyeball. Note the number one thing I said in that, eyeball. It's a ball, a sphere. We all know this, but for some reason, my first two years of painting, it's like that fact just went out the window. I constantly painted my eyes like this, and there's almost zero indication that that eye is a ball, a sphere. If I asked an alien from a different planet to tell me what a human eye looked like based on that painting, they would probably just think it was a flat almond shape attached to the front of a face. I really haven't indicated that this eye is a sphere that sits inside of the head underneath two eyelids. Do you see what I'm saying? Eye ball. <laughs> Remember this demo that we did? Again, the one on the left, zero indication that this eye is a ball, a sphere, or better yet, a sphere that sits inside of the skull then overlaid with two thick flaps of skin. All right, next up is the iris. The iris takes up about one third of the eyeball. It's approximate, don't hold me to that, but it's what I like to go off of. 
The most interesting thing about the iris to me is how it behaves with light. The iris doesn't follow the shape of the eyeball like you might think, and you may often come across incorrect representations of it like this. For the purposes of painting and drawing, the easiest way to think about the iris is to imagine the shape of a bowl or a flattish bowl like this that curves into the eyeball. This distinction is important because it affects how the iris behaves when lit. In the center of the iris is a hole, also known as the pupil. Now, this hole changes in size all day long. Your eyes need a certain amount of light in order to see. The pupil, or the hole, will get larger in the dark to let more light in, and conversely will shrink as it gets lighter. There's other reasons why the size of the pupil might change, and it can be really fun to play with these elements in your art. Take a look at these two eyes. Without any additional information and based on the size of the pupils alone, which eye belongs to the person you find friendlier? More attractive? Which one belongs to the duller person? Pupils can be enlarged for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with light. Certain medications, arousal, and even cognitive interest can lead to dilated or larger pupils. One study showed that even engaging the brain in simple multiplication problems leads to enlarged pupils. On the other hand, your pupils shrink when you feel disgust or disinterest in a topic, and subconsciously, we often view small pupils as less attractive. Think about all the emotions and all of the stories we can tell just between the few millimeters known as the pupils. Little details, big stories. Next, the cornea. The cornea is that clear outer layer in front of the eye, and in my opinion, the most unsettling part of the human body. It makes me so uncomfortable to look at because remember how I was just going on and on about the eye being a sphere? Well, it's not actually a perfect sphere. There's this weird clear bump area that juts out from the eye and that's called the cornea. It's a protective layer and plays a really important part, but just look at it. I don't know, it makes me really uncomfortable that the eye isn't a perfect sphere and has this weird bump on the front of it. Don't judge me, I'm weird, I know. Now, this jutting out doesn't usually play a huge role in your paintings, but depending on the angle, you will see how it affects the eyelid. Check out this video of my eye. Look at the cornea and how it affects and pushes out my upper lid as it moves. Again, you might not encounter this a lot, but I often like to paint weird angles like this, so it's something I think about fairly often. Now, even if you're not thinking of the cornea in this capacity, it still plays a huge part. This clear, wet, protective layer is where we usually find our brightest, most specular highlights. Side note, the highlights on your cornea often reflect your light source. So if you ever wanna know how someone lit their reference photos, just check out the highlights. Now let's look at the cornea in practice. I've already carved out a few eyeballs and added irises. The highlights on your cornea will almost always be the opposite of the light parts on your iris. That's because one is convex and the other is concave and they share the same relationship to the light source. So the dark part of my iris will usually house the highlight on my cornea and so on. I recommend checking out Proko's videos and tutorials on this. He explains it really well. Let's talk about the makeup of the eyes real quick. Your eyes are made up of a clear jelly-like substance called vitreous humor, as well as other fibrous tissue and so on. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because it's helpful to know how light interacts with materials like this. And what you often see is a lot of diffusion and scattering of light resulting in really soft and smooth transitions between the values and the colors in the sclera itself, as well as between the sclera and the iris. One of my favorite practical ways to achieve this soft diffuse look is by using zinc white in my finishing layers. It's a cool semi-transparent white that reduces the yellowing and mimics that soft diffusion of light that we see on the eye. I use it sparingly as it is a brittle paint, but its effect is really cool. I barely touch my brush into it. You don't need a lot. Then on a dry layer, I just really work it into those transitions. It's almost always one of my last steps in a painting. I just think it gives it a really nice ethereal softness. Now, while you might see a lot of diffusion in the sclera and the eye itself, it's important to remember that that ball is also wet. So on top of those diffused soft transitions, you still might see specular highlights, even on the sclera. 
When the eye is really wet, like when you're sad, you'll also see, to, see a buildup of wetness at the bottom of the eye, leading to specular highlights there too. Being strategic about where you add those highlights can really change the emotion of your piece. Now, on the inside of the eye, you'll also see this little bump. It's called a carnuckle. It's a globular spot, so you'll often see a specular highlight here too. Next, let's talk about the eyelids. It took me a really long time to grasp the idea that eyelids had thickness and form on their own separate from the eye itself. And I think that's because again, pictures don't always tell the full truth. Go back to this picture of me. It's really hard to tell from the picture what's going on with the eyelids and it's easy to see how you might think the best solution for painting the eyes here is something like this. A dark line on the top, a dark line on the bottom, but in reality, it's something more like this, where you can see the lids indeed have thickness and are much more complex than simply two dark lines. Now, this example is over-exaggerated just to make the point clear, and I don't ever really paint like this in real life, but I wanted to make something that quickly showed the difference. In my own, own paintings, I'll often abstract some of these ideas. I'll indicate form rather than painting it out fully or pick and choose where I add these hints of anatomy and realism. Let's go through some more common mistakes we might see with the eye. We talked about oversimplification and how this can lead to often symbolic or uninspired looking eyes, but simplification with anatomy and form in mind is actually a wonderful thing. Take a look at this eye I painted. The, this eye is arguably even more simple and less detailed than this eye here, but in my opinion, much more effective. That's because I've simplified it in a way that still indicates an understanding of form and anatomy. Do you guys see the difference between the two kinds of simplification? I bring this up because being able to simplify an object, especially one as complex as the human eye, is a really valuable skill and will pay off in spades when it comes to your art. Striving for more realism or adding additional details is not always the solution. And in fact, it could leave you really frustrated with your paintings. I often mix realism and abstractness and will simplify things by indicating them rather than painting them out fully. Like here, for example, two small brushstrokes to indicate the top plane of the bottom lid rather than painting it out explicitly or here where I've left some areas rough and simple and rendered out other areas more fully. Make some time to walk around your local art museum. Now, hear me out get close to the paintings and really take some time to look. I think sometimes we tend to overestimate just how much detail the greats and the masters put into these tiny areas like the eyes. Early on in my journey, I thought I needed to master some crazy level of realism and use really tiny brushes and get every single detail right in order to paint a good eye. I was shocked the first time I walked around and really studied some of these famous paintings. More often than not, it wasn't how much detail they put into the eyes that made them so good, but rather how well they were able to simplify and suggest with just a few well-placed strokes. It was really a revelation to see that the power of these masterpieces laid in their ability to imply detail rather than laboriously painting out every last single one. Let's take a look at a few examples. We'll start with the Renoir. At first glance, it may look incredibly detailed, but up close, we can see that it's not that he's added a ton of details and painted it in an incredibly realistic way that makes it look so effective, but rather that he's used well-placed brushstrokes to imply a lot of these ideas. We can see the indications of the top planes of the bottom lids, the softness in the transitions between the colors and the values in the sclera, the relatively large size of the pupils. I mean, even this area, let's get up close to the eye. Again, up close, it's not that this eye is painted in an incredibly realistic or detailed way, but rather that the details he has chosen to include are incredibly impactful. Look at this area here. Not only does it indicate the top plane of the bottom lid, but the shift of color and value right here also helps indicate depth, enhancing the overall spherical nature of the eye. Let's take a look at a few more examples. Here's a Velasquez, a Rembrandt, a Zorn, a Degas. Take a good look. Now let's get up close to those eyes. What do you notice? Although their styles are all so different, there's one thing that sticks out to me. 
and each of these it's not the accumulation of detail that makes the eye so effective but rather that each brushstroke is strategically placed to enhance a sense of form depth or emotion i'll put up a few more examples on the screen pause the video if you need and take a second to look at each one note how in each no matter how realistic or not the painting might be the painter's understanding of anatomy and form still shine through without feeling the need of being over explicit if you're having trouble getting in this mindset or figuring out how to be loose with your realism or how to stop yourself from overworking and getting too detailed in these areas here's a few tips that i personally use number one i squint my eyes a lot both when i look at the reference photo and my painting it blurs the colors and the values together, and I know that if it looks good when my eyes are blurred, then I probably don't need to continue adding details in that area. Number two, I paint with a large brush. I've mentioned it before, but I typically like to paint the majority of my painting with a brush the same width as the eye. This makes it impossible for me to get too detailed, even if I want it to. And the third thing, I hold the handle of my paintbrush pretty far back in the early stages. Again, this physically limits me from getting too detailed, even if I want it. These techniques really help me to focus on the big picture ideas, thinking of the eye as a whole and focusing on the form first and foremost. Now let's talk about colors. Two simple things. Be careful not to be too literal with your color choices. Unless you're going for something more graphic and dramatic, Subtlety is your friend when it comes to eye colors. Second, when it comes to colors, the whites of the eyes aren't actually white, but you guys probably already know this. My first step in fixing this painting is by eliminating those bright whites. I often mix a colorful yet neutral gray as my starting point. I use my palette as a reference. It's just disposable palette paper, and I use ultramarine blue, cadmium orange, titanium white, and burnt umber to mix up a color that blends right into the color of this palette. Now, notice I said a colorful gray as opposed to a desaturated gray made of black and white like I had here in this old painting. Making a colorful neutral gray will help when it comes time to blend as the form turns. I don't need to worry about black paint desaturating my colors as the form moves back in space. It's really important here to pay attention Pay attention to just how saturated the colors get as the form turns. There's a few reasons for this. One, the color of the tissue itself as we go back into the eye. Two, the effects of reflected light in those areas. Remember my very non-scientific explanation called the color multiplier? Let's see if we can do it. You guys see that? All right. If you know, you know. And number three, my guess would be that in certain cases, we're seeing the effects of subsurface scattering. Subsurface scattering happens because our skin is not fully opaque. We can test this with a simple flashlight. When, oh, when I put my hand behind the flashlight, we can see that the light enters into my skin, all right, here, bounces around and comes back out on the front, leading to this weird red glow that you see. You'll see this a lot too when a person is lit from behind on the ears. And my guess is that in certain lighting conditions like here, that red glowiness is the effect of the light hitting the top of the lid and a small portion traveling through the lid and coming back out. Again, just a guess. Now, notice the quick difference that made in all of about two minutes. I put down my gray and used some antique or craplax rose to blend it out onto the edges to get that nice fleshy red color. Next, I make my first indications of form on the eyelids and knock back the color a bit of the green. With just a few changes, and even with my iris and pupils still looking so funky here, we've improved quite a bit in a small amount of time. Now let's talk about tools and materials when it comes to painting the eyes. First is surface. Personally, my go-to is painting on panel. I like a pre-primed, ultra-smooth surface. It really lets the texture of the paint shine. There's some downsides to this, though. Your paint can slip around because it doesn't have much to stick to, especially in the early stages. I combat this by either laying down an acrylic underpainting first or by simply going in with nice, thick, messy brushstrokes. Why fight the mess when you can embrace it? When working on a surface like this, I'm really able to control the amount of detail I want to add, and I use these two classes of brushes to do it. 
the Aspen Princeton brushes in all sizes and the Princeton Select blender brushes. They're an incredible duo and give me a ton of flexibility. I also enjoy painting on oil paper, especially when doing an a la prima, but sometimes things blend so well on paper, it's hard to get a lot of detail, especially in small areas like the eyes. So when I'm working on oil paper, I usually don't get that detailed in the eyes. Now let's talk about some digital tools. If you're having trouble wrapping your head around the colors or the values that you're seeing when it comes to painting the eye, don't be afraid to pull out digital tools. I often pull out the color picker tool to help evaluate color and the posterize tool is great for double checking your values. It can also be helpful for understanding how a complex form might be simplified into a few shapes if squinting your eyes isn't working. I've talked about it before, but when working from a reference photo, I like to think about the gravity of the shapes I see especially the eyes. It's one of the easiest ways to nail a likeness to your subject that often gets overlooked. You can check out a full demo on that in my video titled, No Sketch, No Problem. Next, let's talk about emotion. We mentioned before just how emotion, even just the tiny pupil can communicate, but when we employ the whole eye, or better yet, eye socket, we can portray a really wide variety of feelings. From the subtle tension in the eyelids to the slight arch of an eyebrow, every element can contribute whether you're wanting to display joy, sorrow, surprise, contemplation, or whatever else. We can make a whole video just on this topic, so I'll be quick and boil it down to my top two tips. One, I study cartoons for shorthand information on how to portray emotions. Cartoons need to convey a lot of emotion with very few lines and limited info. This is helpful for when I'm working from imagination or I wanna change the emotions to something other than what's in my reference photo. It's quick and easy and gives me at the very least a starting off point. The second thing I do when it comes to emotion, instead of looking at photos for reference, I look at video. I'm a big fan of the phrase, paint what you see, not what you think you see but sometimes you don't know what to look for until it's been pointed out to you. That's what video does for me. It clearly points out small differences in emotion. It can be really hard to look at a still photo of an emotional person and be able to detect exactly what muscles are or parts of the face are being activated for that emotion. For example, in this picture, it might be hard to figure out exactly what's going on with the brow bone to convey this amount of emotion, but when I watch the video back, it's a lot easier to see how the muscles are being activated. I can see that the inner ends of the eyebrows are being pulled up and closer together by these muscles here. Now, this doesn't mean I'm getting video every time I take a reference photos of, or I take reference photos of a model, but rather when I'm wanting to fine tune or change the emotions in the painting, I'll take a video of myself making that expression. I'll note what micro changes are happening and apply it to my painting. It's fun, but it also means I have tons of crazy photos and videos of myself making all sorts of expressions on my phone. They say the eyes are the windows to the soul, but more often than not, I think it's actually the eyebrows. All right, that's a wrap. That's the end of our journey into painting eyes. I hope you have found these tips and tricks as helpful as I did when I first discovered them. Now, thank you to all of my subscribers and a massive, massive shout out to all of my wonderful folks on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs and without y'all, these videos would simply not be possible. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing either here or over on Patreon. Keep painting, keep exploring, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.